this, whereas we were recording this before, now we're doing this live. Um, the only thing is we are going on a different time right now because we had a lot of things to do yesterday. But normally we do the lesson preview at 1.30 every Saturday, every Sabbath. Uh, and that 1.30 is Central Standard Time. So put it in your calendars if you want to follow us and you participate. Uh, hopefully we get there when there's it's, there more interaction. But 1.30 every Saturday, uh, we do this SS lesson preview. Now this time, because we had a lot of things to do yesterday, we had you know, Pathfinder Bible Experience and all sorts of stuff. We had to do it today on a Sunday. But otherwise, it should be 1.30 every Saturday. So we go into lesson four. Uh, as you can see in lesson four has something to do with offerings and it's very quaint because it this is the, the cousin of tithing. So we go into a short intro. Uh, I love this. I might have shared this with you, but I love this story. There was a pastor who ended up uh, retiring, but he saved a lot because they really loved traveling with his wife and he bought a small yacht. Uh, and uh, because they've been saving for this small yacht for the longest time, he called uh, the yacht the Sar of Ages. Well, to the consternation of uh, a few members who are more conservative in their outlook and said, why should the pastor buy a yacht? You know, it, it's unbecoming for a pastor to have a yacht. And they started talking among themselves. It became a very controversial issue in the church. And right before the pastor retired, he went to the pulpit and said, well, uh, I heard so many uh, feedback from our yacht uh, in, uh, into my retirement. So I decided to change the name of my yacht. Uh, it was the Sarah Vegas before. Now I'm going to rename it to the Great Controversy. So um, I had to be smirk at that. But uh, when we talk about money in the church, there's always this controversy. And yet uh, we know that uh, Jesus was very adamant in saying that the most popular God and idol that we have is the money or mammon. So let's go and kind of review exactly what we covered last week, you know, before we go into the offerings. Uh, we know that the tithes, according to Numbers 8.21, uh, to the Levites I have given every tithe. Uh, all the tribes, when they entered uh, the promised land, had a portion of the land allocated to them. But the Levites did not have a portion of the land because they had to take care of the tabernacle. They had to serve in the worship place, the worship venue of the children of Israel. Since they, they, didn't, have, they, they didn't have land, they couldn't uh, uh, take care of their flocks, they're going to do, do farming, they concentrated on the services of the temple. The design of the Lord was... To give every tithe, he will tithe the entire nation, the children of Israel, and get all the tithe and bring it to the storehouse so that the Levites, the priests ministering in the temple, which makes worship possible, the exercise of worship possible, can be fed and they can be sustained. Now, going into the New Testament, Paul gets this model from... Uh, the Old Testament and said, do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offering? So he echoes basically what we read in Numbers. The, the reason why tithing was important in the Old Testament was to support those who minister in the temple of God. Now you go into the New Testament, into the early church, Paul is saying, we don't have priests because the temple's gone. We don't have uh, uh, Levites, but really we have workers in the context of the church now. The Holy Spirit gives us gifts. Uh, some of the gifts that he gives are pastors and teachers and apostles. And these people who are full-time dedicating their lives into proclaiming the gospel and and edifying and building the church, they need to get their food from the people. So that there's the concept and somehow the concept of tithing comes in because of the principle. In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. So you, you look at the, 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 the model, you know, the template that Paul used in the Old Testament is what they're doing. There was a 
temple where people gathered for worship, and it had to be maintained. You need musicians, you need priests to do that, and in order for the priests and the Levites to be sustained, you need tithing to make that possible. Okay? So in the New Testament, the workers, for full-time workers for the gospel, and for the church, which is now the temple, so to speak, will need to be supported, and we have the tithing system to handle that. I thought, I thought I'd, I'd mention that because uh, there's a lot of talk around us. There's no explicit command to give tithes in the New Testament, so we really don't need to tithe anymore. I, I don't think we should look at the, the, the details uh, and the nitty-gritty details of tithing. Rather, we should look at the principle, and by following the principle that has been laid down in both the Old and New Testament, we can see the sense of giving into the work of God. Well, here are some church tithing statistics. They say that tithers represent about 10 to 25 percent of congregations. Only 5 percent of Americans are tithers. Most, 80 percent, give about 2 percent of their income to tithing donations. It's an oxymoron to say, I will tithe, I will, I'll give you a 2 percent tithe. You cannot say 2 percent tithe because tithe by definition is 10 percent. So there's no such thing as a 2% tithe. You gotta return the whole tithe into the storehouse. About 3 to 5% of those who attend and donate to churches do so through tithing. Okay? And then 17% of Americans responded that they tithe regularly. Tithe statistics reveal that most tithers, about 77%, donate 11 to 20% of their income. This tithing percentage is much higher than the baseline of 10%. So those people who are faithfully giving their tithes are actually giving more than 10%, rather than less than 10%. Those people who are actually giving the tithe. About 70% of tithers base donations on gross income, and not the net, which is before, before taxes, they set aside money, with 10% for the work of God. Okay? Uh, they use another survey, which is very revealing for a uh, survey for all Christians, practicing Christians and non-practicing Christians, and you see the color coding there. Yes, I said my giving at 10% or more of my income. Yes, I said my giving at less than 10% of my income. Yes, but I give a different set proportion or amount each year. No, I do not currently give financially. No, the amount I give varies. Uh, what's that yellow? You know, that, that yellow code, and people who go to church and they don't care to give at all. For all Christians, that's like a fort for all Christians who go to church and benefit from the blessings of the community of faith, and still they don't care. You know, at least you have like 21% uh, uh, forgiving. So this is all Christians. So let's break the, the down uh, into the practicing and non-practicing categories. So for the practicing Christians, obviously 42% is a lot higher than uh, the non-practicing, which is only 16%. And then if you want to look at the potential tithe and actual tithe per person by age group, you know, if you want to look at the generations, uh, boomers, millennials, Gen Z, the alpha generation, you will notice that uh, the biggest uh, tithers are in ages 40 to 49, followed by 50 to 59. Uh, the younger you are, of course, you're not yet earning. There's not a whole lot there. And then the older you are when you retire, that, that's the trend. But right there in the middle, where you have the, uh, where you have the density of uh, the members of the church, you, give, you get the giving right there. Uh, the good news is based on the survey, the tithers are better off financially. You know, you get 28% you are debt free, okay? Whereas only 13% of non tithers, you, you can see the numbers. Uh, it favors those who tithe, which is uh, evidence uh, for the fact that God is faithful to his promise when you do pay your tithe. And then there's some good uh, lessons we can learn, especially when we go into the offerings in a little while. Tithing adults started young. Those who are regular tithers, the faithful tithers, are started giving eh, in the 20s and their 30s and their 40s and 50s. And then the research from 4,413 tithers, the question is how much of their income do they donate? 54%, over half of those tithers, so faithful tithers, donate 11 to 15% of their income, which is very encouraging. Research from the same group says, do they give that 
plus off their gross or net income. Almost half, 42% tithes on the gross. And 96% of tithers attend church every week unless sick or traveling. So there's a direct correlation between church attendance and faithful participation in the community and your generosity and your willingness to be able to give to the Lord's work. So here's a tight distribution. Uh, I, I captured this from the Potomac Conference too, so you'll have an idea of what's going on. There's a suggested giving of 10% from for the tithe to support the ministers, you know, the gospel work. And of course, we got the, the local the local budget offering and you got the conference ministries. Um, just very quickly, this is the tithe distribution generally of what happens. You, we return our tithes in our local church, but uh, about 60 some percent are retained by the local conference in our, in our case in the Illinois conference. And then so much goes to the division, and then it goes to the union, and it goes to retirement and education and special assistance. I further blew this up, at least in the NAD, what do they do for the remittance of uh, the portion of the tithe? This is like, uh, they retain, it's retained by the conference and the union, which is like 84%, but the NAD, the division, uh, keeps about 16%. So you got direct ACM, it's from conference, from the unions, and special assistance in terms of the, the allocations of the fund. So how does 915 break down? Uh, this is uh, further information. $100 breaks down into $66 for local conference, $10 for defined benefit and for retirement, $9 for union conferences, 915 for you, you see what we we uh, showed you earlier and 585 for general conference. The whole idea is we give our tithe instead of retaining it in the local church. The model with, that we follow as a denomination is that there's a body that distributes this evenly so that the world church can benefit from what we do. Very quickly, we covered this in our last preview. Uh, the tithe, uh, the principle is it belongs to God, therefore we don't keep it. It is holy, we don't take or use it. God specifies it, we obey and follow. It is an act of worship, it's about God. It's a spiritual response, it's about the heart. It's not uh, just a financial obligation. And it's expression of loyalty, it's about our faithfulness. And going back to the general principle of stewardship, we said this, if you're just a donor and you're not a steward, you're, you're giving because it's about me. A steward says it's about God. The donor says it's my money. No, it's God's gifts for the steward. Donor says it's my project. No, it's God's work. I'm in control. No, God's in control in terms of what you give and how you're blessed. Giving is infrequent. Giving is a lifestyle and the amount matters. The heart matters for the steward. Now, the brass stack of what we're trying to discuss uh, in this preview. You take a ordinary tight envelope, this is an envelope I get from the Illinois conference, so we'll have an idea what we're talking about, and I broke it down, put it on the screen. Uh, these are the categories of giving within the tight envelope. I know this has been translated into an electronic form, because there's so many ways to do it, like you can do the website of the church, the way we're doing it, and you can fill this out electronically the way you fill out the envelope. But this, this drove most of the giving in our Adventist local churches, at least here in the Illinois Conference. So you got a tithe, you got a local church budget, and then there's a donation to the conference, and there is a donation for the world missions. Okay, you got to understand <clears throat> that on top of the tithe, which is distributed not only for the local, uh, local conference use, goes all the way to the union and the division and the general conference that benefits the church as a whole. It's, it's, more, it's more centralized, you know, in the, the concept of what they call a storehouse. Bring everything in the storehouse and those people managing the storehouse will be the ones to distribute the funds and the resources that has been stored in the storehouse. And of course, the local church is important. If you don't give to the church, Who's going to keep the church warm during winter, cool during summer? 
uh, who's going to maintain the facility so that people can have a place of worship. So you need uh, to give to the local church. So normally we call it the, the combined budget. We combine all the expenses of the church and just give a percentage of our income to support the projects and the wear and tear of what's going on in the local church. So this is our, our burden for this lesson preview are the offerings. Any gift that we give to God on top of the tithe. Okay, that's what we are studying. Okay, and in order for this to happen, I picked uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 to 4 as our passage, and that will drive our discussion. And it talks about the four way plan for systematic giving. The first way of giving back our offering is a set pattern. Let's read what verse 1 says. Now concerning the collection for saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. There was a big problem in Jerusalem uh, because they were having employment issues. Uh, the non-believers were not giving employment for the, the converts to the church. <laughs> More than that, there were famines that hit Jerusalem, you know, one after the other. So remember, during the preaching of Peter, 3,000 were baptized, and a little later on, another 5,000 men were added. So very quickly, they had 10,000 members. How do you feed them if there's famine? How do you sustain your members? That's why the Jews who were in Jerusalem, so they can sense the support of the Gentiles. Remember the, the context here. Paul went around and gathered money so that they can give this money to Jerusalem to support those who are needy in Jerusalem. And in that context, the verse begins by saying, concerning the collection for the saints, I directed their members in Galatia, in the Galatian church, you know, in the region of Galatia, he said, gather your money so we can help the, the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. I want you to do the same thing. So there was a pattern that Paul gave to the churches in order to give the offerings. Note, this is on top of the support for the workers. It was not about supporting Paul and the apostles. He's supporting those who are in need in Jerusalem, which can be categorized as offerings. So... If we go back to Malachi 3, which, was the, which is the very basic and fundamental passage for tithing, it says, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. So it concerns both. It's not only tithes and offerings. We can rob God and cheat God in terms of his work if we withhold the offerings that he is doing. Okay? And it's very clear in Malachi that you return both tithes and offerings. Tithes just support the temple, but they're are needs that needs to be given back to God. If you don't, you are cursed with the curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. So the, the, there is a very bad repercussion of not being faithful. It's, you, you separate yourself from God. You, it's strange. You alienate yourselves from God because you do not give God what is due him. Uh, it's almost like owing somebody... Today, somebody borrows money from you, and this guy never cares to pay it back. You, know, you strain that relationship. And then, of course, the promise is, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. This is the, one of the blessings of being faithful in returning your tithes and your offering, which means the opposite. If you don't, you will lead to material ruin. Uh, if you ax out both tithes and offering. And then other parties... And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. So there will be a moral and a spiritual decay. Your witness will not be as powerful as it is if you're, uh, uh, you know, compared to when you're faithful to returning your tithes and offering to God. So if you want to summarize what the deal is in Malachi 3, it says, Our giving should not be established by our feelings or by relevant projects that's being promoted, or by calls from the pulpit. It should be established by the frequency of the increase or the income that he gives us. We'll cover this in a little bit. But basically, your giving should be habitual. There should be a cadence. There should be a pattern. There should be a pattern when you give, and that includes giving your offerings. Let's, let's 
take a, li a little dive into what this giving is all about. Traditional giving, giving usually happens as the result of two things, okay? Information, whatever is given to you, the, the need to give, uh, and what the cost is, and of course, emotions come into play. You know what the project is about, you know what the concern is, then depends on how you feel about it, then you respond accordingly, and you give. Okay, the information is often, there's a problem, limited, it's screened, it's selective, and it's altered. You know, it's, not, it's not as accurate as we expect it to be. And the problem with emotions is sometimes the appeal is often for recognition. I'm giving so that you can recognize how much I give. And there may, there's a guilt trip that's laid on some people so that they can give. And of course, I mean, they, they appeal to your generosity, and then they make it a duty to give. The result is often a feeling of manipulation, <laughs> sanctified materialism, and a growing resistance. So it looks like that's, a, that's not a healthy way to approach giving. So if we go to the biblical giving, we see a combination of information and emotions. Okay? The information is open and it is with integrity. You know, you like the, the, the Jerusalem residents to the poor in Jerusalem. You know, it's an open, hey, our, our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem needs your help. You know, there's got to be integrity that goes with it. And then look at the congruency with the scriptures. And then in terms of emotions, you respond in terms of your personal walk with God. And of course, instead of just dealing with your, your emotions, you wait and listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your hearts. Okay, so giving in this context then grows with our spiritual growth. It is a natural part of partnership with God, and it means investing God's resources in His kingdom. So considering all of this, you can set a pattern where you're giving. Um, it always reminds me of the story about Toyotomi Hideyoshi. He's a Japanese warlord who ruled over Japan in the late 1500s. He commissioned a colossal statue of Buddha for a shrine in Kyoto. It took 50,000 men, five years to build, but the work had scarcely been completed when an earthquake of 1596 brought the roof of the shrine crashing down and wrecked the statue. It upset Hideyoshi so much in his rage, he got his arrow and shot an arrow into the Buddha and says, I put you here at great expense and you can even look after your own temple. Uh, there's a little humor there, but what he's saying is if you invest on something else, in something else, in someone else other than God, it will come crashing down. So set a pattern for giving, and that pattern should be aimed at giving to God because he owns everything. The second way of uh, having a systematic approach to giving is make it a scheduled priority. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up. Okay, so it's a very favorite verse that uh, a lot of our friends and and neighbors and within the Christian community, this, oh, there you go, there you go, that's the, that's the support for Sunday keeping. The church was meeting on the first day of the week, therefore, uh, they were really, they really changed the Sabbath from the seventh day to the resurrection day, and they started meeting on the first day. And people really browsed through this text, you know, skim over it, uh, a surface reading, when in fact, if you read it very closely, the word used here with putting something aside, the Greek phrase used here is literally saying putting aside at home. Paul is basically saying, you know, aside from having a pattern, the first thing you do in the week, as the week starts, before you do anything else, set aside money for the cause of God. Okay, so the question is, uh, why do... Seventh-day Adventists not give. Okay. Eddie Capuni, who had a plethora of uh, stewardship materials, he was stewardship director until 2015 in General Conference, 
said, most Adventists were not concerned about the church handling of money, disgruntled over church theology and practice, or dissatisfied with the level of pastoral care they received. Only a quarter felt they couldn't afford to pay tithe. And this is a survey done by the stewardship department. Hardly anyone asserted that I need to be convinced from the Bible that Christians should return tithe. So this, this thing, oh well, yeah, they don't trust the church. We got issues. There's hypocrisy. You know, I, I, there's doctrinal issues. That's not the issue. He said. So what was the most common reason for not tithing? Very surprisingly, he found out in the survey that uh, people don't tithe and give their share. They forgot. They simply forgot. There is no intention in stewardship. Deuteronomy 8, 18, remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. If you forget that, you will not return to your tithes and your offering. Remember the fundamental assertion that we've had in our study, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Since God owns everything, we don't own anything. So when we give our tithes, we actually don't pay our tithe. We return our tithes. Because what we return, what we give, is not ours. It's actually God's. Okay? Uh, I was in a church yesterday when I did the lesson study for tithing. There's a lot of people who were asking me questions after church. And we were talking about budgeting. You know, most of the time we talk about stewardship. We don't guide our members into how to invest their money and how to their manage their resources at home. Instead, we just ask them to give, which really makes sense. And I think what we need to do is teach our members some financial management, including budgeting, so that that can help, you know, prioritize the giving that we have. We kind of covered this, this is from Money Wise Investing, and I suggest that you listen to Money Wise. It's free every day, you know, it's a bit look, look for Money Wise in your your radio stations, or you go to the web. There's a lot of guidance there in terms of investing, saving, and the way you do budgets, okay? We talk about live, give, grow, and owe, okay? And if you can just go back here, it, 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 the, the target is having financial freedom. And in order for you to do that, you know, like in giving in level one, you start giving. Level two is you start giving percentage, based on percentage. And then level three is start giving sacrificially. In the same token, when you live, track monthly spending. You know, you, you, you don't realize that you're eating too often outside and you're eating up into your budget. You're spending more than uh, you earn, okay? Create and maintain a spending plan. Have a spending plan, okay? Set lifestyle finish line. How much is enough? You know, don't spend more than what you earn. But if you don't have a budget, you won't be able to figure it out. And then how do you grow? You save for emergencies. You may have an emergency fund, and then you start saving for retirement, and then once you start managing your resources, then start doing investing with compound interest. And in fact, if you get them for a 1K plan at work, then utilize that. It's most of the time it's matching. And then, oh, it's about debt. You know, the, the, you know, credit card is one of the biggest challenges of, of stewardship among believers here. Repay your credit card debt. Repay all debt except for your mortgage. Of course, this is the, the biggest debt. And then repay your mortgage. Once you're done, you're free from debt. You're not slave to anybody anymore. And of course, the advice is before you do anything, you start on the giving first. And Dave Ramsey, another very popular and a very wise financial Christian counselor, says, we suggest putting giving at the top of your budget followed by saving and then spending. Do you get that? I mean, uh, if we were to do the details of financial management and money management with you, Dave Ramsey is saying, while you're doing the budgets and putting things together, the first thing you need to do is set aside the money that you will give. Well, there's a very strong uh, biblical support for that. Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Uh, I love the way C.S. Lewis puts this in his own terms. He says, 
put first things first and we get second things thrown in. But put second things first and we lose both first and second things. He actually said the only way to have first things is to have second things. And to treat second things as second so that the first thing can be first. Yeah, this is a, a play on words. But the bottom line is you need to prioritize. You must schedule. You, you have a pattern, but you must schedule the priority. Okay? Uh, but on top of the pattern, on top of the schedule priority, the next principle or the next way you need to follow for this systematic giving, as we find in the passage, is a sensible proportion. Okay? So as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. So Paul said, hey, like the people in Galatia, you know, set aside money. They used to have a pattern doing this. And you do that first thing in the week. It would used to be a schedule. And then when you do the allocation, make sure it's allocated proportionately to what you earn. May, what does it say? <clears throat> as he may prosper. As the Lord prospered you, based on what he has given you, then he, that there, this is where the concept of a percentage giving is. So depending on, you, know, you don't, in, in the early implementation of uh, our systematic benevolence in our church, in 1859, they, they set an amount for every family uh, and every member of the church to set aside every week you know, so that even the poor can do it. Eventually, we grew into a more mature approach to systematic benevolence, which is percentage-based. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. And three times in a year, a Jew is, goes to Jerusalem to celebrate the, the major feast, and they're supposed to give. They should not go there empty-handed, says Deuteronomy. What else? They should give according to the blessing that has been given to them. So how do we put this into an application? There are three systems of offerings within our denomination, within the church. This is what we call a personal giving plan, which involves the tithes and the combined budget. And then we see this calendar of offerings. You know, if you, you, if you open the, you will see that in the tithe envelope. We, we saw the slide there earlier. And then there's a combined offering plan. Let me explain this to you. For some reason, the NAD has not adopted the combined offering plan yet, okay? But the, the, look at the merits and let's see how we can process this. The first is a personal giving plan. Part of your personal giving plan is tithing. Uh, as soon as you receive your salary or any earnings or any blessings, you set aside 10% for that. And then part of your personal giving plan is your commitment to support the local church. How does that go? I'll, I'll give you a lightning uh, coverage of what uh, a combined budget is. The way you do that is the church sits down at the beginning of the year. They figure out the, the projects for every department, whether it's Sabbath school, whether it's community service, you know. And then based on the projects that they have, they will, have, they will assign a budget. Oh, this is how much we need so that we can implement our goals for the Lord this year. So you get all those monies together from the departments, okay? We sum it up. After we sum it up, we figure out, they, they call the suggesting given guide, is the tithe potential. These are tithe, okay? How do we distribute it among the members? So based on that pool of money, which is in the storage, okay, in order for us to answer, instead of just giving to the Sabbath school or for community service, we look at the big pool and say, okay, let's say, okay, in order for this to be fulfilled, to get this money that we need for the year, I will need about 3 or 5% of my salary, of my earnings to support it. So what you end up, at least for a church, you end up having 3 to 5% of your salary on top of your tithe to make the personal giving plan. The personal giving plan, of course, is 10% from your tithe and another 3 to 5% for the local church needs. Now, you ask me, there's, there's a big difference between an Adventist church and the church down the street. Most of the churches are congregational in their model, which means when they receive their tithes, they spend the tithes for the congregation. <coughs> we don't do it that way. When we receive the tithes, as a church, we believe in a global mission, that tithe does not only, does not 
uh, retained. It's, it's not retained in the local church. It's remitted in the conference, which is then di uh, the distributed to support the union and the division in the general conference. So it doesn't stay in the local church. What stays in the local church is the local combined budget. So you need to commit to both in order to support your local church and support the church as a whole. Now, there's, the, there's such a thing as a calendar of offerings. And let me grab that. This is for 2023 is the calendar of offerings for the Illinois Conference and NAD. So, so say January 7, you look at the dates. So this is the weekends, local church budget, religious liberty, local church budget, and then on and on and on until December. So every conference <coughs> has a local uh, giving calendar. That's why we have what we call a calendar of offerings. And once the plate is passed every weekend, that particular that particular area is earmarked for whatever we give. So back in the early 2000s, they said, there's a big problem there. Everybody starts promoting their own departments, and there's a competition for the resources of God. So let's come up with what we call a combined offering plan. The combined offering plan is a policy of distribution for non-assigned offerings. So on top of the tithe and the offerings, and on top of uh, the giving calendar, forget the giving calendar. He said, you know, you, why don't we just grab all the offerings outside the tithe and, and the combined budget and make it a combined offering plan so that we put it in the storehouse and then people decide how to distribute it for the world church. So it follows the concept of the tithe. 50 to 60 percent remains at the local church, 20 to 30 percent to the local field junior division, 20 percent to the world missionary budget. That's the way it's spread out. But you can't, can't understand what this means. Okay, let's, let's just further go into this. Uh, so in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the world, you read Acts 1.8. And they say, if you follow the combined uh, offering plan, uh, after you collect all the offerings outside the tithe and the combined budget, uh, local church fund, you then get the money and people who are managing the storehouse will give it both to the local, to the region, and to the global needs of the church. And th this is the, the rationale for the, com the COP. Opening voted during the uh, a system of distribution of offerings recommended and promoted by the New York Conference. It uses the same principle applied in the reception and distribution of the title the offerings. It supports all levels of the church that are sustained by regular and systematic offerings and free will offering. And the plan supports all the different regions and administrative levels of the church. These are all the benefits, and I'll give you the handout so you can go through them. Um, you don't have to worry about special and regular offerings anymore. You just give to the church, and what happens is you end up going, go, g giving all the money that goes into the coffers of the church every week into one pool, and that one pool is distributed. Okay. Like I said, of all the divisions, the NAD has not accepted it. That's why we have, we still have a 2023 calendar of offerings for the LNA conference. Should we follow this? Don't know. The tithe is already centralized. Uh, should we also centralize our offerings? And then you, they can discuss the benefits. Again, these are late gray areas. It doesn't stop you from giving, but these are methods that for more, uh, more equitable distribution of a resource. So how do I approach this? We are prompted to give in three ways. I'm prompted to give as a believer in terms of commitment. And my commitment to God is as soon as I receive my salary and my income, I'm committed to tithe on that income, and then I'm committed to support my local church. So in my commitment, I do my budget, first thing I do is set aside a tithe in the local church offering for the budget. And then I'm also prompted by conviction. So when I say conviction, actually they're doing a, a massive outreach someplace in Manila in the Philippines. I should give a higher church organization. You, oh, it is written is making a difference. AWR is making a difference. I should give to AWR, and then based on the conviction of the Holy Spirit, then you support such organizations accordingly. 
And of course, the third prompting is compassion. Well, somebody just got sick and they don't have enough money to cover all the medical expenses. And the family is pretty close to the church. Then you give to those who are in need. So how do I react to all of this in terms of offerings? Oh, I, my commitment is unwavering. I will commit to the tithe and the combined budget offering for the, that's my commitment. That's my personal giving plan. I have decided with, we have decided with my wife to do missions every year. We go back to the Philippines to do a mission project. Uh, we've been doing that since oh, 2009, 2010. So we set aside money for the missions. And you know how they say, to go to the Philippines, you do the planning, you do the work, you sweat it, and you also have to spend because they really don't have money over there. So that's missions, and we're convicted to do that. So we set, set aside money to do it. And then every so often, people come to us and say, hey, can you help out? You know, this kid's having a tough time going to school. They don't have enough money. So we set up some scholarship, and some people who need some medical assistance, we also give. So we go to these three C's. So let me be honest with you. After looking at these three C's, I have no time to look at combined offering plans. And I have no time to look at calendar giving. So at least personally, my conviction is, let me do the commitment of the tithe and the combined budget. And then as I see fit within the calling of God in my life, uh, in my conviction, support some missions, mission projects and outreach projects. And when I see people in need, in compassion, I'll give to them. That's my personal opinion, but that's the way we're comfortable and the way we steward our resources in terms of supporting God's work. And I think it's not that shabby. You can take a look at this and hopefully it guides you in giving your offerings. Again, offerings is on top of the tithe and the combined budget in your local church, at least within the context of the Adventist denomination. Lastly, not only a set pattern, you know, which is a habitual pattern, not only a scheduled priority where you set aside tithing first and offerings first before you even budget for money and clothes and insurance, what have you. And then it's a sensible proportion. Whatever God gave you, you, you know, that's, that's the neat thing about this pattern and this priority. You don't give more than the way God has blessed you. And the neat thing about this is the more you give, the more God will bless you. I, I had to tell this story. I shared this yesterday. There was one guy who came to his pastor. He said, I'm, Pastor, you got to help me. Big problem. What's the problem? Well, I used to earn about $1,000 a month. So I tithe. I give 100 for my tithe. You know, it's split it into two. You end up 50-50. Um, but I've been promoted. I am now really blessed. I'm making 5000 a month now. And giving 500 is a little too much, I think. You know, this is my struggle now. Since the Lord has blessed me with the job, now I have to tithe more because it's on a percentage basis. And then the pastor said, no problem, brother. I'll, I'll really help you. Why don't we kneel down and pray now? So the pastor started praying and said, dear father, I have a brother here. He's got a problem. Uh, used to really tithe regularly, but now that you bless him, he's got uh, a higher paying job. He's finding it difficult to give uh, the tithe for the salary he has right now. You know, please do me a favor, Lord. Can you lower his salary back to a thousand so he can tithe easily? No, 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 pa Pastor, stop your prayer. It's okay, I'm going to tithe. That's a humorous uh, illustration, but yeah, yeah. We think of how much we want to give back. We forget that it was God that gave us the blessing in the first place. Okay? A sensible proportion. Give proportionately for what God has given you. And lastly, there's a sure provision. Um, Paul says, and when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. I had to put this in because... There must be an element of accountability when you give. You don't just give and people use it for a different cause. That's why we have graft and corruption 
in governments and in institutions because there is no integrity, there's no financial accountability. Look at what Paul is saying. Hey, you set aside money first day of the week, you know, set a pattern, schedule priority, sensible proportion, use that. And I want to make sure when I collect the money that I will give it to those whom you recommend. Look at this. I will send those whom you accredit by your letter. I, he got a letter accrediting these people can be trusted to carry the money to Jerusalem. So you need trustworthy people put in the financial coffers of the church. And Paul says, if there's, a, if there's still a problem, I'll be willing to go there and be with them myself to ensure the integrity of what you give. So part of uh, responsible stewardship is financial accountability. And then they give you an illustration. When strong typhoons hit the Philippines, one after the other, uh, about two, three years ago, as a church, we gave to the relief operation. And I had a friend, uh, he's now the youth the director of the division in South Asia Pacific, and he coordinated the relief efforts. And I could trust him, he's very accountable. Uh, and he sent videos and he sent pictures of what they did, you know, so, so the givers will know where it's going. And he also sent receipts. Whenever we give, we want to make sure that wherever the gift is earmarked, that it goes there as we've expected. And it doesn't hurt to ask for a receipt so that you know that it was actually dedicated to the particular cause. And if you get some feedback for what has happened, all the more. It's very encouraging to see what's going on. Um, my wife and I have been committed to sending about four students to school. We give a scholarship to these four students in one of the poor areas in the Philippines. I, I did the week of prayer in that uh, college, and since most of them are poor, uh, we decided to sponsor about four kids. And we give this regularly every year to help them, and in a couple more years they'll graduate. And what they do every year is they send us their grade slips, they send us pictures of what's going on. That's very encouraging when you see this and, and when people are being empowered. So accountability is important in the stewardship. What does it say? Freely you have received, freely give. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So we need accountability you know, to, to make sure there's a sure provision. But in the opposite end of the spectrum, you need anonymity. Okay, what did Jesus say? So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. During the time of Jesus, the Pharisees, who gave to the temple, made sure that there was a parade in front of them so that everybody knows how much they give. They were giving for show. And Jesus said, don't do that. When you give, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. That doesn't mean you don't ask for a receipt, you know, or don't ask for feedback and pictures to help you appreciate what is going on. All this is saying, do not give in order to promote yourself. You give in humility, you know, it's saying when you don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. This is just talking confidentiality. You know, don't, as, as much as possible, avoid letting people know it was you who gave. What's important is the money has been given, and it's been, it'll be the use to the Lord's work. When the promise is, the Father sees you, and he will bless you accordingly. So don't worry about that. Uh, there's there's a, a tension that we need to maintain in the last method, the last way to do systematic benevolence, is there's got to be accountability and there's got to be anonymity. And, and it's, it, it, sometimes it's tricky. But the bottom line is if you give, not for the sake of yourself, but to give for the cause, and actually you give to God, it will resolve the tension by itself. So as we land here, one of my favorite stories, uh, Wendley Phipps is probably the most visible Seventh-day Adventist that we have today who sang for the Democratic Convention, who was there when Nelson Mandela was installed in his leadership in South Africa, who was there to sing for Mother Teresa a few months before she died. 
uh, sang for presidents, sang for leaders of nations, and as an Adventist, sang for the Billy Graham Crusade. He talks of a story years ago, he had the chance to record one of his first albums, Lord, You Are My Music, and since he had the lawyer managing all his, his appointments and his contracts, uh, he didn't realize that the lawyer connived with the lawyer on the other side. Uh, long story short, he lost the rights to all his songs. And the songs that he wrote himself, he couldn't sing. It hurt him a lot. And uh, a member of his board, a kind gentleman, approached him one day and said, uh, uh, Brother Wentley, his name is George Johnson, the Lord has touched me and impressed me to tell you that we should buy the rights to your songs. And he was elated and said that, 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 that I really appreciate that. And they wrote a letter to the recording company and said, you know, I, it isn't for ministry. It's not to earn money. It is for ministry. I like to reach a lot of people. And, <laughs> and then, of course, the, the managers and uh, those who were in the company, are you kidding me? We, got, we get rights to the song. There is no such thing as returning back the rights to the song. Are you kidding me? But they did a CC, copy furnished to the vice president. For some reason, the vice president came back with the letter and said, we normally do not do this. But they gave back the rights to the songs of Bentley, and he proceeded to be one of the most visible pastor and musical artists that we have in the denomination. And this is what he said. After that experience, I learned that redemption is when you buy back what is already yours. That's stewardship. So God owns everything, and yet we sin. And the enemy has stolen what rightfully belongs to God. So he sent Jesus Christ to redeem us. That's why you are twice his, by creation and by redemption. The payment that freed you was the precious blood of Christ, the lamb with no defects or imperfections. You were not bought by gold or silver, says, says Peter. You were bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. So as we close here, it's one of my favorite stories and narratives for stewardship. A little boy came up to his mother one day in the kitchen and while she was fixing supper, uh, this boy handed her a note. And the note read, for cutting the grass, $5. For cleaning up my room this week, $2. For going to the store for you, $2. For babysitting my kid brother while you went shopping, $5. For taking out the garbage, $1 for getting a good report card, $5. For cleaning up and taking the yard, $5. Total owed is 25 bucks. Well, his mother looked at him and standing there and they could see, the boy could see the memories flashing through her mind. She picked up the pen, turned over the paper that uh, he handed her and wrote this on the paper. It stated, for nine months, I carried you while you were growing inside me. No charge. For all the nights that I've set up with you, doctored and prayed for you, no charge. For all the trying times and all the tears that you've caused through the years, no charge. For all the nights that were filled with dread and for the worries I knew were ahead, no charge. For the toys, food, clothes, and even wiping your nose, no charge. Son, when you added up all of this, the cost to you is no charge because I love you. You know, when you look at stewardship that way, I guess it gives you a different perspective. When you count how much you've done for God and you think you've done it for yourself, you will try to own it, but it's not yours. 
But God doesn't come back and tell, hey, that's mine, you know, why are you so greedy and selfish? No. God will lay out all the things that he's done for you and will tell you, no charge. That's why Paul is saying, freely you have received, freely give. And with that perspective, I hope that in our lesson preview right now, you will see the value of giving back to God. Your committed giving with your tithes and offerings, uh, the local budget and, you know, your convicted giving to missions. And then when you see people in need, your compassionate giving. And by doing so, you will have a very systematic way, a habitual way, a cadence that you can use to be a faithful steward of God. And again, the promise that he said is when you put my righteousness first and seek me first, all these things will be added unto you. Added not because you want to enjoy the blessings, but ultimately, you want the name of God to be glorified and return what is to him because you have been bought by a price by Christ and God owns us twice, both by creation and redemption. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Father, thank you for this very practical lesson. We have more of this coming as we go through this quarter. But Lord, uh, teach us to understand that the tithe and the Local church budget offerings are needed by your work, by our local congregation, by the world church in its outreach and the ministers and the evangelists. The same token, dear Father, we have all our mission goals and mission projects. May you open our hearts so that we can be generous and cheerfully give to make outreach possible. And when we see somebody in need, as you have told us in your word, may we be responsive to that need and support those people. Oh Lord, may this uh, very practical suggestion become part of our lives, embedded by the Holy Spirit, sealed with his power and his love, so we can enjoy what it truly means to be your disciples, cheerfully giving, freely giving, because we have freely received from you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.